Yes, I'm from Pakistan, but living in Japan since 1996. Oh, I see. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's your uh, PPT. That's such like uh, Pinto. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pinto this, 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 from yeah, Japanese. <laughs> this is not Pinto. This is called uh, New Year food. New Year, everybody order this kind of special food. This is a special food. Oh, it's, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, see you I from this side. Enjoy, I hope you will enjoy this presentation. Yeah. I myself really uh, like Japanese food very much. <laughs> yeah. Let me know when can I start. Sure, sure. I'm, I'm ready. Probably uh, okay. Nadia may start by right now, please. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Good afternoon, Honorable Mrs. Lina Purianti, PhD, as the third Vice Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, Universitas Airlangga. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to our presentation about food and Muslim heritage in Japan. My name is Nadia. And I am a student in the Department of History, Uni Universitas Airlangga, and I will be serving you as a moderator today. Before the presentation begins, I would like to introduce our presentation. Our presenter will be hearing a presentation from Dr. Said Akhtar and Mr. Sukimoto Kiyichiro on the subject. We'll be hearing a presentation from Dr. Said Akhtar first. So, Dr. Said Akhtar, yes. time is yours. Thank you very much. How long do I have, by the way? How long I can talk? Um, the time in each session is approximately 30 minutes. Okay. Um, sorry, Dr. Akhtar. Yes. Before you present, presenting your presentation, let us to hear the opening speech from Mrs. Lina first. Um, please. Okay, Miss Lina, time is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Nadia, as the moderator of this uh, discussion. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, it is really nice that uh, this afternoon we can meet together to discuss a very interesting topic about food and Muslim heritage in Japan. Yeah, I mean that uh, as we know that uh, Japan is known as a country with Muslim community as a minority. Even in the beginning of uh, this uh, discussion, even I asked uh, kind of a curiosity, how then uh, if not mistaken, probably Dr. Said Ahtar will discuss about the kind of a halal food. This is something that not many people of us that known about it. Uh, before that, uh, I give my warm greetings to Dr. Saad Ahtar from the, uh, as the director of uh, Nippon Asia Halal Association Japan, and also Mr. Sukimoto Kyoichiro, who are willingly to uh, share with us uh, their uh, knowledge about uh, food as well as uh, Muslim heritage in Japan. Uh, we do appreciate this uh, discussion because by right now, our university, uh, <coughs> also from the Department of History, uh, are working really hard to uh, like uh, build a good collaboration with many uh, international sco uh, scholars around the world. So that's why then uh, your willingness to share with us is uh, 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 as an honor for us. And for that, we really appreciate. And we do hope that this uh, discussion is not only stopping here, that then we can continue with the further uh, research or probably also join publication in the future. And as well as we also uh, invite you to be academic peer list as part of uh, our effort to build our uh, strong collaboration, kind of a, a permanent collaboration in the future. And then once again, uh, back to the topic, uh, I do hope that uh, Dr. Said Ahtar and then also uh, Dr. Sugimoto Kyuchiro can 
give us a kind of a, a insight how then the topic of a food and then also Muslim heritage also can be found in Japan while what we understand so far with our limited uh, knowledge is then is that uh, Japan uh, has a very uh, limited number of a Muslim and then of course it will be very interesting uh, if you can share with us that our understanding is not completely expressed, uh, it's not completely uh, telling about the real situation in the uh, diverse Japan. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Said Ahtar, and then also uh, Mr. Sugimoto Kyoichiro. Uh, we do hope that uh, we may have a fruitful uh, conversation for, uh, from our today discussion. Okay, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Officially, I open the discussion. Thank you so much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikum assalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, I start with the Japanese food as a world heritage. Actually, I'm not going to talk most, mostly about Japanese food as a halal food, but uh, you will see that there is a very great uh, connection between uh, halal food and Japanese food. So I'll keep on discussing those points that where the Japanese food is naturally halal and doesn't need any halal certification. So uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm a Pakistani national, uh, food scientist by profession. And I'm very lucky that the best Indonesian lady is my wife. Uh, <laughs> I married in 1999, the picture I attach here. <clears throat> and honestly, uh, living in Japan in the beginning was a bit tough because language, but once we understand the Japanese culture and Japanese food and Japanese people, this country is a very beautiful place to live, a very peaceful place to live, and very blessing from Allah SWT for all, us, all of us who are living here, especially as a Muslim also. Why? Because it's a very Muslim-friendly country. I have a PhD from University of Tokyo in 1999. My major subject was food science. So that's why I chose a topic which uh, all of you will be interested in and related to food. I know that Indonesian people very much love Japanese food. And today I'm going to give you a little bit more delicious touch of this food, inshallah. Uh, I am also the chairperson of a halal certification body, very famously known as NAHA since 2013. So it's a combination of uh, a Pakistani man talking about Japanese food and Japanese culture and uh, talking about halal. So it's a combination of uh, all these things I'm going to touch. Maybe you have heard that uh, UNESCO is giving the heritage certification kind of things to many famous places of the world. If you go through the search, uh, mostly they search, uh, recognize uh, buildings or parks or famous areas or famous countries or those who has a very long time uh, relationship with any kind of heritage. But uh, when you go to the food side, you will see very few places and Japanese uh, food is considered as uh, intangible cultural heritage since 2013. So each of my slide will have one of the picture uh, on the side of the slide. So I hope it will continuously catching your attention more than my face. You will look towards the beautiful picture and beautiful presentation of food on every uh, slide differently. And I am so lucky that many of these pictures are taken by myself in front of my own food. So I'm very lucky to have the taste of all these foods. Okay, uh, when we go to the Japanese usually concept of uh, what kind of food is available, particularly thinking from Indonesia, or Malaysia, or Pakistani people, what they think about uh, Japanese food. The first of all, the famous names comes in front of their list is uh, sushi, sashimi, tempura, ramen, uh, takoyaki, teppanyaki, soba, udon, yakizakana, onigiri, this kind of places. But if you see among this list, you will see that there is one or two foods are there, which is basically are not Japanese food. 
but now they, they are introduced in this country's culture and it's very famously introduced in this culture. One of that famous food is ramen. Ramen basically is not a, uh, ramen basically is not a Japanese food. It is coming from China and introduced to the Japanese culture, but it's become famous very uh, recently, like many, many Japanese people, almost every day they want to eat uh, Japanese food. Now, when it, we come to the ingredients of, uh, usual ingredients of Japanese foods, uh, fish is very commonly eaten food. Wagyu, Wagyu is a Japanese uh, beef. Then uh, Niwatori is a homegrown chicken. Usually is a red color, or brown color, or those kind of color, not a broiler chicken, but we call it uh, in the past history, whatever we grow in our own home, and then if some guests come, then we slaughter that, that is called nivatori. Then is a mirin, sake, shoyu, miso. When we're talking about uh, Japanese foods ingredients, this mirin and sake are very famously known as one of the ingredients which also disturb the halalness of the Jap uh, Japanese food. But to be honest with you, when I search uh, back in the history, I went back like, 50 years, then 100 years, then 150 years. <clears throat> and back in 150 years, you will not see the beef in Japanese food. You will not see the chicken in Japanese food. You will not even see the pig pork in Japanese food. You will not even see the mirin as a kind of alcoholic drink, hummer as a Japanese food. Sake is not an ingredient of a Japanese food. So all these things are introduced later in the history, and that is a recent history. Like for example, if I may tell you that uh, sake was a drink for Japanese people, but it is considered as a very luxury thing long, long time ago. Luxury thing by mean that uh, only rich people can drink and they also drink very little. It's not possible that the sake can be uh, ingredients of a food on everyday basis. Uh, then when we are talking about Wagyu, Wagyu is actually the introduced in Japanese food after World War II. It was not there at all in the previous history and Japanese were not that rich that they can eat this expensive uh, Japanese beef, what they are eating nowadays. Then uh, coming about uh, pork and pig, uh, pig has two forms. One we watch we what we grow in the farm, and one is is a uh, wild what we call it boar. So wild boar is uh, usually very early time came to Japanese food. Uh, it was in 1920s and after that. Before that, this <coughs> uh, <coughs> pig or pork was not a part of Japanese food at all. In the very early history of uh, Japanese food when they introduced this uh, wild boar. That was also very little, very few places being uh, used as a food ingredient. <clears throat> now come to the mirin. When we are talking about mirin, actually the recently mirin, which is called hammer and has alcohol percentage of eight to 12%. This mirin is also uh, introduction of a new industry. The, processing industry. Previously, uh, like 70 years ago, I asked uh, some old Japanese ladies that how they were using this mirin. So mirin was actually the combination of uh, uh, honey and shoyu. Shoyu is a soy sauce. So if you mix these two things, it becomes uh, mirin. And in that mirin, the purpose of mirin, why Japanese people use, because some Japanese foods have a sweet taste. So they want to get it from uh, honey. And they want to make it like, a, like if you see on the picture left side, all this food individually, you will feel that it's very much shiny. Like uh, before eating, you want to take a picture of this. So that shiny thing come from mirin. So uh, the purpose of show you combination with uh, uh, honey, it make the food more uh, sweet as well as 
good looking. Like you, when you see that, you feel like, wow, I want to eat that. So that kind of feeling come from mirin. So mirin, basically, whatever available nowadays, in the past, it was not available. So when you go back to the uh, Japanese history of uh, 150 years ago, so you don't need to have a halal certificate for the food what Japanese people are eating on everyday basis. So it naturally it is halal. Why? Because it consists of fish. It is has uh, food, uh, vegetables and show you or miso is naturally halal. So all this food, what you see on your left side, it all consists of halal ingredients, even nowadays. So mostly uh, when you try to understand the Japanese ingredients, what make us confuse is these two sake, which is called reorishu, and the mirin, which is uh, uh, nowadays is considered as a hammer. But to be honest with you, that uh, these things were not there in the past, and Japanese chef never used this kind of things. Now, the real Japanese food, this is very important for us to understand that the real original base Japanese food is called Ichiju, Ichiju Sansai. Ichi means one, Ju means soup, and San is three, Sai is dishes. If you see the picture in front of you, illustration picture in front of you, you will see that uh, soup is always there. It is must in Japanese food. Then uh, there must be three dishes. One is a fish dish, second is a side dish, third is a side dish. So these three dishes are usually whenever you see in Japanese uh, cultural food, you'll find it. And rice and pickles are always there as a staple food. Like even the few uh, poor families also can afford this set of foods. So basically, if you go more deeper in Japanese cultural heritage food, that consists of these uh, three, four items, and it's a must part of this food. And now the modern food, which we are eating nowadays, those are also consist of a similar food. If you go to a Japanese house on everyday basis nowadays, still you will find this Ichiju Sansai, uh, one soup and three dishes. This is the basic concept of a Japanese food. And it is coming from centuries ago. It's not new concept. It is coming from centuries ago. Japanese people really uh, keeping this concept with them always. Uh, whenever they cook the food for lunch or for dinner, uh, even for breakfast, you will see that this three combination of things will definitely will be there on your dish. And soup is, miso shiro soup is really common. Varieties of soup are so many, but miso shiro soup is very commonly uh, we understand and we know that. So that's why we call it Ichiju Sansai. Now, previous picture was the illustration. Now this is the real picture, what you can see here in this picture. There is a meat dish, there is a soup, rice, vegetables. And if you go back in the back end of the food, as a food scientist, what kind of uh, food you should eat on everyday basis, which consists of all uh, dietary uh, things in that is. So in this particular picture, if you see, they have the carbohydrates are there, proteins are there, fats are there, fibers are there, liquids are there, vitamins are there, and above all, the prettiness. The, whenever you are going to eat the food, like I am from Pakistan, so usually in Pakistan, whenever our country food is uh, if a rice eating people. So there is a rice and there is a type of curry beside that. And that curry can be a meat curry, that can be a vegetable curry, that can be another curry like padang food, you can say that. Padang food is still has some variety, but in India, Pakistan food is has nothing special attraction in that food. So you cannot take a picture. Yeah, maybe taste is there because spicy and some other uh, strong spices are part of that, but the beauty and uh, what we call the energy is not really taken care while cooking Indian or Pakistani food. While in this case, in Japan, uh, all these foods uh, have full energy, like vitamins. If you cook on the high fire, the vitamins will die. You, will not, you cannot get the vitamins from the same food. 
So these foods, what you can see here, they are not cooked on the high fire. This is a cooked on the low fire, low flame, and it can keep the, all the in, ingredients like carbohydrate, fat, proteins, and fibers and vitamins and everything is as such very good for your health. And I, I, if it is in my control, I really wish to introduce this to my two beloved countries, Indonesia and Pakistan, that if you want to eat food, eat food like this kind of combination, which consists of all your necessary food on everyday basis. One of the reason behind uh, Japanese long life is actually this balanced food. The Japanese long life, if you may have heard that women and men uh, average basis is plus 85 years plus, which is uh, not a common in any other country of the world. So around us, like when we meet Japanese people on everyday basis, uh, we ask what is your age and we guess what is your age, we say you, probably you are 60, 65. And then the old lady will laugh and say, oh, no, 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 I'm 85. So th this kind of things comes from this beautiful and energetic uh, food, which is <clears throat> Japanese people keep their heritage all the way and consistently making the similar food. Now, what is the meaning of intangible? You, if you see the UNESCO statement, they say intangible food. So now, now I am myself is surprised that this is an untouchable means. The food is usually we, we eat, like whenever we are hungry, uh, food comes in front of us and right away, come, come, let's eat, let's eat. And in Indonesia also I've seen, in Pakistan also I've seen, like we attack the food. Yeah, but in this case, when you see this uh, on your left side, this is the Japanese sweets. You know, in the food science, we study that, how we choose the food. First of all, before eating, we choose the food with our eyes. So before uh, we do anything, our eyes will give one statement, which is, ah, so delicious, looks like so delicious. When you see the food, which you say looks like so delicious, then you will be happy to eat that. In Islamic terminology, if you know that halal and tayyiban, the tayyiban part is the look beautiful, the taste very delicious, and have full of energy. This all combination is called tayyiban. And if you see the sweets, uh, honestly, if this has come in front of me, I don't know how delicious is that, but I will feel so difficult to cut it and eat it because it's, it looks beautiful more than it will taste beautiful probably. But uh, on the other hand, I have seen and I've tested all so many different kind of Japanese uh, sweets also, uh, Japanese food. I have so many pictures, more than hundred pictures uh, my wife was asking me to show you more pictures, but because of time constraint, I kept it very few pictures. So the point is that in Japanese uh, traditional food, which is coming from long, long centuries ago, the one of the beautiful thing is that first of all, you see and you create an opinion that yes, this is a beautiful food. I want to take, take a picture of this first before I eat. And you know, Indonesian habit, is that taking a picture of food is more important than eating. <laughs> so uh, for Jap uh, Indonesian people, this Japanese food is really always so beautiful. Taste-wise, uh, it's expressible when you pour it in your mouth, for example, Wagyu, and you don't want to talk for a certain period of time because it's so delicious in your mouth. And although it's a beef, like in Pakistan, beef is always considered as a hard meat, then you need a pressure cooker to, to uh, able to make it chewable or digestible. But in Japanese beef, it is considered that you should cook, uh, uh, what do you call a medium well done kind of thing, so that when you cut it and you take a bite of this, you feel very much juicy in your mouth and it is a melting beef in your mouth. So it's not only uh, you look and say beautiful, but you also taste is really expressible that you enjoy, you feel uh, you are part of in the, you know, in Al-Quran, Allah subhanahu wa has mentioned so many beautiful scenes of Jannah. So one of the scenes of Jannah is you will eat so many beautiful foods. When you are considering thinking that what kind of beautiful food that would be, 
if uh, <laughs> me being a Pakistani, if I think a Pakistani curry, I, I think, no, thank you. I don't want to eat in Jannah. <laughs> but when I think about a Japanese food, uh, I think, yeah, this is a, a representable when Allah SWT mentioned that uh, food must be very delicious and it will be very nice and you will never be enough with this eating this kind of food. And of course, Japanese food is full of energy as I explained in previous slide. Now coming to the heritage, uh, keeping the same con concept as centuries ago, like this food, what you can see uh, in front of you is called Sechiriori. Sechiriori is a new year food. Now in this Sechiriori, if you go on every single block on this picture, you will observe the beauty. You will observe that a huge time has been taken to give a presentation this this food. It's not only a food what you just put in your mouth and is finished within a short time, but it is also a beautiful presentable food. So in, in my opinion, that if you have ever got a chance to come to Japan, please never miss a chance to eat this sechiriori. Sechiriori is only considered as a new year food. Now, the, with the passage of time, as I mentioned, Japanese people got, brought some innovations in their food. They kept it the, as such the beauty, they kept it the taste, they kept it everything, but then unfortunately, they put some uh, uh, things which was not there previously in the history, which is like, if you see, there is some bacon you can see here, there is some beef you can see here. So in the very early history of Japan, this kind of things were not there. Sechi food was there, this food, the concept was there all the way, but uh, the food, which is now in, in this picture, you can see there are three, four, five foods are there, which is uh, introduced in the later in the history. But few leaves you can see here uh, in this picture, if you, this kind of picture, this leaf is not an eatable leaf. And this is only a decoration. So why they put the leaves in the decoration and how much it, it, it costs them uh, annually to make their food beautifully. Uh, there is one area in Tokushima, Japan, where uh, old ladies of the village, they go in the forest and they choose the beautiful tree, uh, tree leaves. They take a picture of that and then they send it to the company who want to buy those leaves to sell it to the high quality restaurants or high quality making foods. So you will be surprised to know that those fall off leaves, uh, which is, has a beautiful pattern on that, uh, per year annual sales of those leaves are 2 million US dollars. And who is collecting that is the old ladies of the village. Nothing special, any skill you need. What you need a beautiful skill is to choose a leaf which can make your food beautiful. Presentation should be there in every uh, food. So I'm really impressed with this particular statement when I went to that area and the, the people explained to me, I went to those forests also. So when I see the beautiful leaves, uh, autumn leaves, the one leaf has four or five colors. Uh, its grading is beautiful, the brown, the yellow, the green, the, all those colors are in one leaf. And that leaf start from that forest and come to your food in front of you. It's not a eatable leaf, but it is a decoration uh, leaf only. So Japanese food keep this uh, heritage in their life until today, although we are very much modern country, you can imagine that uh, second or third biggest economy of the world. Uh, they change their habits very much. They, they change their clothing. Like if you heard previously, the ladies were wearing kimono, men were living kimono. They left those things, but they didn't leave uh, this they, to make their food beautiful until today, like nowadays is uh, December. So in December, there is a uh, every company who is making the sechiriori and the famous Japanese restaurants, they get the order of this food. And once they, they get the order, this food will be uh, go to that person home and the person will invite more than 20, 30 friends. 
and they will decorate this food in front of them and they will talk and they will laugh and they'll play and they feel happy spending very good time with the family. So I really uh, like this food and uh, I think my time is 30 minutes is over. I would be happy to reply any particular question if you want to ask me about Japanese food as a, as a heritage of a, uh, UNESCO. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for Dr. Said. You're welcome. Now we can move to our next se section. Please welcome Mr. Sukimoto Kiyichiro. Mr. Sukimoto. Ah, yes. Ah, Assalamu alaikum. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now moving along to our session, please welcome Mr. Sukimoto Kiyichiro, who will be speaking to us about culinary and Muslim heritage in Japan. Mr. Sukimoto, time is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Miss Nadia. <coughs> uh, uh, <coughs> everyone, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Actually, the last week, uh, this Dr. Said Akhtar uh, gave me uh, some information about this workshop. And I contacted uh, Dr. Nunuk, and then she gave me this uh, the assignment, actually. <laughs> and in fact, uh, there are many things uh, uh, in heritage, I mean, it comes to heritage in Japan. But due to lack of time, I would like to share uh, what I already know uh, from my research and the study. So that is a Muslim heritage in Japan. So let me share uh, the slide. Uh, can you see? Okay. So my name is uh, Kyoichiro Sugimoto. Uh, I'm Japanese. Uh, and I joined, I mean, I embraced Islam 25 years ago, alhamdulillah. And I'm currently uh, chairman of Chiba Islam Cultural Center. And I also uh, Islamic researcher, or outreach specialist in Ayera Islamic Research uh, and Education Academy uh, in the UK. And today I'd like to present a Muslim heritage uh, in Japan in 30 minutes, inshallah. Okay, the, this is a photo of the Kobe Masjid. This is the first masjid in Japan. In Kobe is next to West Japan, next to Osaka is the second largest city. So contents of my presentation, uh, basically three. Number one is the first masjid in Japan. Number two is the first Japanese Muslim. Number three is the first Japanese Muslim who performed Hajj. So now let's see, uh, overlook, uh, uh, overall picture of Japan and then today's uh, situation, Muslim community. Alhamdulillah, today 110 masjid, probably more than 110 masjid in whole, all of Japan. It was only uh, two masjid when I embraced Islam 25 years ago. So it's a dramatic increase. So especially around Tokyo, there are so many masjids. And I came from, and the brother Akhtar also came from uh, Chiba. Chiba is just next to Tokyo, just a little bit east of Tokyo, near sea, near seaside. Uh, some, these are some uh, major mas masjid uh, in Japan. Uh, from the left top, uh, this is the Kobe Masjid today. Next is uh, Asakusa Masjid in Tokyo, and Ohanajai Masjid is also in Tokyo, and the Sendai Masjid in northern part of Japan. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, next uh, law is uh, Tokyo Jami, the Tokyo Masjid. Next is Osaka Masjid and the Kyushu Masjid, and the Gyotoku Masjid in Chiba. Next law is uh, this is Ehime uh, Masjid. Gifu Masjid, Tokushima, ah, sorry, uh, this one is, uh, 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 sorry, uh, 
think this one is Mie uh, Masjid or something like this. Next one is also Tokyo Masjid. And the Kumamoto Masjid, Tokushima Masjid, Kanazawa Masjid. And this Hokkaido Masjid. And the last one, last one is Chiba Islamic Cultural Center. So let me explain about the first masjid in Japan. So historical background of the first masjid. So uh, there are early Muslims who came to Japan the first time. They are from the pre-independent Indian subcontinent. They're Indians. And they basically came for the business. So the end of the 19th century, they settled in major city like in Tokyo and Yokohama and the Kobe and they engage in business. And they built the first resident masjid in Kobe in 1935. Uh, it, it was the uh, first masjid in Japan. And this masjid withstand the test of time. Uh, by in, in, enduring World War II, all the other the buildings there destroyed. But only this masjid was remained. Uh, even the church was destroyed. And even during the great earthquake, uh, happened in 1995, uh, which was destroyed the same church for the second time, but this Kobe Masjid was remain. I share some photos. Okay, this is very ancient photo of a Kobe Masjid in 1935. You can see the faces. Uh, some, there are some Indians, however, majority, they are from actually Russian. They are Tatars. And they look, uh, when we see, they don't wear, you know, the women, when you look at the women, they are, nobody wear hijab. Now, this is another pictures. So when we see the left, uh, this aftermath of Second World War II, so it's all around Kobe Masjid, there's no building, all burn out. But Kobe Masjid survived as it is. However, the Kobe Masjid lost its residence. Just be, there is a uh, annex, the compartment, just beside Kobe Masjid, but it was lost. But the main masjid is remain. It's very strong structure. And there is inside the picture, So there are second generation Muslim migrant immigration immigrants consists of Tatars and the uh, Kazuno Lukos who's from uh, Russia who came to Japan in the early 20th century to escape communist regime. So there is a, the Russian revolution <clears throat> during that time. And these Tatars, this Muslim, they escaped, they became refugee to Japan. And they live with the Indian Muslims uh, in Kobe and build a masjid in Nagoya. Nagoya, is, Nagoya Masjid is a second masjid. However, this was destroyed during the Second World War. <clears throat> and they built, uh, they also built the Tokyo Masjid in 1938, uh, where the late uh, Abdul Hai Qurban Ali led the Islam activities. So he is uh, the imam <clears throat> of the um, Tokyo Masjid. Many of the young Muslims uh, have migrated later to Turkey, Europe, and the United States from Japan, and only a few of them still remain in Japan. So they are basically descendants, the second generation, third generation. They are no more in Japan. They, they left, uh, probably because of the war situation uh, uh, during like 1940s in Japan. So this is a photo, very early photo of Tokyo Masjid. The left side, the right side, this is an imam at the center holding the key. Now going to open is the first inauguration of the masjid, holding the key. Now I'm going to open uh, like this. Okay, so the first Muslim students to arrive in Japan were Chinese. And about 40 of, uh, of these students studied Waseda University in Tokyo in 19. Nine, <clears throat> uh, they published Islam magazine in Chinese with an Arabic title, The Waking of Islam. And Rashid Ibrahim, who was a traveler and a famous guy, 
publish the first issue of the magazine. So three students from Otoma Empire, uh, including Abdul uh, Munir, son of Abdul Ibrahim, Arashid Ibrahim, who was traveler and the famous Dai missionary, came to Basila University in 1990. And during a World War II, many students from Indonesia and Malaysia came to Japan. Uh, however, what happens for them is because of World War II, many students from Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, they became victim and they are murdered by the atomic bomb. Uh, dropped on Hiroshima. Still, uh, we can find the, uh, the graveyard. Uh, there is a name, uh, Malaysian name, Indonesian name on the uh, tomb. Uh, to Indonesian and Malaysian Muslims, uh, they are third group Muslim migrants. The first is from Indian subcontinent, second, the Tatar and the Russians. Number third, this third group is Indonesian and Malaysian Muslims. So oh, there, there was uh, some dispute uh, between them and the Tatar Muslims because of different madhab. So it's already this kind of issue was started during this very early stage of Muslim community in Japan, because the Indonesian and Malaysian, they are Shafi, while Tatars and Hanafi school. So their controversy prompted the late Tatar Muslim leader, Abdul Hai Qurban Ali, to write a letter to Imam al uh, Somi, uh, Imam of the Masjid al-Haram in Makkah that time. And regarding this controversy. And the Imam al Mansuri uh, responded with a, a paper entitled Sultan's Gift to Japan. And the, the paper was published in the, in the 30s. And it, was, uh, it has been uh, reprinted many times and is still in circulation. And the in Indonesian community continues to be the largest Muslim community in Japan, uh, still now. And, and they have a school and masjid in Tokyo. And then these buildings have been <clears throat> used by Muslims for many years. So this is a very recent development, uh, Tokyo or Indonesia Masjid in 2017. So ambassador of Indonesian embassy attended and officially opened. <clears throat> I was also invited in this uh, session. Uh, this is a masjid, it's very actually uh, uh, narrow entrance. And then the just left is uh, Indonesian school, Bara Indonesia. <clears throat> because this property is very limited, so they, they make like this uh, unusual shape. But Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> so next one is the first Japanese Muslim. So let me explain the first, uh, the historical background of first Japanese Muslim. So Japan, Jap Japanese history, uh, of, uh, I mean, the Muslim history in Japan is just 100 years old. It's, it's quite recent. And the era of Japanese Renaissance called the Meiji era. era this is uh, uh, the modernization, starting of modernization in Japan, which be, be, began in 1868. So only two countries, Asia, Ottoman Empire, and Japan were enjoying the independence at that time. And both countries came under pressure from the West because of colonization. Uh, this gunship and a lot of pleasure. Uh, they decided to establish good relations between them and they began to visit each other frequently. And the most important visit between two countries was a mission to Japan by King Abdul Hamid II, uh, who arrived in uh, 1890 aboard uh, in the Erutul. Erutul is the name of the ship, carrying more than 600 sailors and the soldiers led by the commander in chief, uh, Osman Shah. It continues, after meeting the emperor of Japan and successfully completing their mission in Japan, they were on the way back to Istanbul when a powerful typhoon capsized the ship while it was still in Japanese territorial waters, so lost the lives of more than 550 crew members, including Sultan's brother. Uh, so it was a very great tra tragedy. And the survivors were later uh, carried to uh, Istanbul by two Japanese ships. And the martyrs of the accident were buried at the accident site. Uh, this is in Wakayama, uh, just middle of Japan. And the museum was built uh, not far from the accident site. Uh, despite uh, intermittent uh, changes in the re uh, re regime, Japanese and Turks continue to commemorate the ac uh, accident at the aftermath site every five years to this day. So this is a movie uh, this is a kind of commemoration.
to remember what happens 1890 uh, when this uh, the ship of Turkish ship uh, was destroyed and the Japanese uh, villagers just near the sea, sea coast they help uh, the survivors. So these Turkish people they really remember. So when the Japanese uh, people when they uh, get some trouble during the I think the Iran war, uh, Iran revolution, uh, uh, this Turkish government helped because they remember uh, what happened during this 1890. So it became uh, the story uh, and the movie. This is a real site of accident. On the top, the right side, this is a ship Erutul. This is Turkish ship. And the next one is a place where this, uh, the typhoon clashed uh, this ship. And this is Wakayama uh, prefecture is here. And number one, this number one, this is a, a monument for remembering this accident. And then number three is a museum. So this is a very historical moment. Uh, if this ship was not destroyed, probably there was no first Muslim, probably. <clears throat> Why? Because the young J Japanese, J Japanese journalist named Shotaro Noda, who had started a donation, a drive to, for the families of Turkish martyrs. So he is a journalist, he collected many, many uh, uh, the donation, the money to, to help this, uh, uh, I mean, survivor's family. Noda traveled to Istanbul to carry this uh, donation and handed over donation to the Turkish authorities. Then uh, he had an audience with uh, King Abdul Hamid II, and he asked Noda to stay in Istanbul and teach Japanese to the officers, military officers of the Ottoman Empire. And while Noda was in Istanbul, he met Ab uh, Abdullah Quilliam. Abdullah Quilliam is a British Muslim, very early British Muslim from Liverpool, who introduced Islam to Noda. And after long discussions, Noda became fully convinced of the truth of Islam and accepted Islam. So many people actually ha have no idea how this first Muslim embraced Islam in Japan. Uh, actually through the British preacher, Dai. And I chose the name Abdul Halim. In fact, Abdul Halim Noda uh, can be considered as the first Japanese Muslim because of the historical record. This is a picture of uh, Noda Shotaro, uh, he got a uh, Muslim name, Abdul, uh, Abdul Halim, 1891. And this uh, the person is Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam. Uh, this British Muslim, everybody knows this, this person. Uh, the first Mus uh, British Muslim, uh, or I could say that uh, he is the first uh, British Muslim who established first mosque in Liverpool. And this, the right side, this is a historical document uh, in, the, in the journal or in the newspaper. So it's what exactly it says. So Abdul Harim Afendi, uh, uh, Shotaro Noda, the correspondence of the Meiji uh, newspaper Tokyo, who is in, uh, stationed in Istanbul. He is between 24 and 25 years old, embrace al-Islam. Istanbul newspaper have reported two days ago that the Japanese Noda accepted Islam and the circumcision, this is a, a sunnah, and has been made to him and they given the name Abdul, Hami, Abdul Halim. According to our investigation, we came to know that Abdul Halim Afendi uh, embraced Islam as a result of discussion with Abdullah Quilliam Afendi the leader of Muslims in Liverpool. And during the presence of the Quilliam Afendi in the Istanbul, uh, he explained to him how Islam is rational and the logical religion. And he was speaking with him in English, giving him all proofs and the reasons which were comprehended by Abdullah Halim. Thus, uh, he guided the right path, guided to the right path. And this was mentioned by the uh, Turjama al Hakikia newspaper dated 2nd June 1891. 
their uh, conversion took place at their military school in Bangaliti in Istanbul on Friday, the 29th May 1891. He was circumcised. So from this historical document, now as uh, so Muslim, uh, non-Muslim uh, researchers in Japan, uh, they confirmed uh, he is uh, uh, the first Japanese Muslim. So next is uh, the first Japanese Muslim who performed Hajj. So uh, his name is Kotaro Yamaoka. And in 1904, uh, he graduated from the Russian Department of uh, Tokyo School of Foreign Languages. Uh, today, uh, this is the Tokyo University of Foreign Language. And in 1909, uh, under the oldest or elders of Yasumasa Fukushima of the general, he set on their pilgrimage, the Hajj to Mecca to gather information on the Islamic world. So he met up the Abdul uh, Rashid Ibrahim in Bombay. Abdul Rashid Ibrahim is, a, is a, a one of the researcher and traveler at that time. And he also came from Tatar. And after receiving the lecture on the Quran, he made a pilgrimage to Mecca on December 1909. So uh, basically he has uh, uh, some uh, mission uh, to collect information. Uh, this is uh, just before, after, uh, just before the Russian, Japan Russia war. And then later, uh, there's a Western colonization, uh, the military power uh, uh, threatening uh, actually the Asia and the Japan too. So he has uh, some mission to, to have uh, uh, the good relationship with Islamic world uh, to, to defend. Uh, the Japan from this Western the military power. Anyway, he performed the Hajj and they recorded as the first Japanese Muslim who performed Hajj. And the, the right side, this is a book uh, he wrote about his experience of Hajj uh, in Japanese language. Not only Hajj, he, he wrote about his traveling, how he traveled this Arabic Arab region something different from Japan. So last not but the least, I'd like to just briefly overview the 100 years of Islam in Japan. Okay, uh, I just explained that 1891, the Shotaro Noda became the first Japanese Muslim, 99, and Kotaro no, uh, Yamaoka became the first recorded Japanese pilgrim, the, the Hajj to Mecca. Uh, 1924, Tanaka Ippei became the second uh, second uh, Japanese pilgrimage, uh, uh, the Hajj to Mecca. And 1935, Kobe Masjid was established by the Indian traders and the Tatars. 1937, Nagoya Masjid was established but burned down in 1945 during World War II. And 1938, Tokyo Masjid was built. And 1952, the establishment of Muslim Friend Friends Association. Later, Japan Muslim Association today. 1961 established the Muslim Students Association. Today uh, it is called the Islamic Center Japan. 1982 Arab Islamic Institute in Tokyo was established. Uh, this is under Saudi Embassy in Japan. And the same year that the Japanese translation of the Quran was published by the, uh, by the Japanese Japan Muslim Association. 1985 uh, the bubble economy and because of this uh, uh, the, 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 the flux of the immigrants workers from South Asia, so Muslim the community expand from this time, 1980s. So when we see from the first generation, so-called recent, recently we can see some elder uh, Muslims in Japan, they are from 1980s. However, 1986, the, uh, the Tokyo Masjid became so old and they demolished. 1992, establishment of Islamic Circle of Japan. This is the largest Pakistani uh, Muslim network in Japan. 1994, the establishment of Japan Islamic Trust. A headquarter is in Otsuka Masjid in Tokyo. <clears throat> this also led by the uh, Pakistani leaders. 1994, establishment of Chiba Islamic Culture Research Club uh, in Chiba University. Uh, later, it became Chiba Islamic Cultural Center today. 
So this is uh, the, the foundation of uh, Soko CICC. And year 2000, Tokyo Jami uh, was uh, built. So this is, uh, 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 I mean, after the innovation of uh, the first Tokyo Masjid, uh, first uh, Tokyo Masjid was destroyed. The later, this land was kept as it is. And the 2000, uh, year 2000, the Tokyo Jami was uh, established as a Tokyo Masjid. Uh, 2017, the Tokyo uh, Indonesian Masjid uh, was established, and this is affiliation with the Indonesian Embassy uh, in Japan. So these are just very brief uh, history and Muslim heritage uh, in Japan. So that's all from my uh, uh, presentation. Uh, so thank you very much for your listening. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for Mr. Sugimoto. And for all ladies and gentlemen, if there are any, if there are any questions, please submit them with the right hand teacher or via the chat column. Thank you. Hello, Koichiro. Nice to meet you. Ah, nice the first time we meet you. So I just confirmations uh, about your statement about, uh, in food Muslim. Uh, if we see the historical background in Japanese, I think we can uh, we can some conclusions that uh, there are separation and distinction between food Japan and food Muslim Japanese. Is that true? Uh, uh, may, may I? May I? Uh, yeah, I just confirmations yeah. about that's your PPT. Uh, you yeah. can uh, show me about the historical background Muslim yeah. Japanese. So yeah. <clears throat> I just uh, conclude my pre element conclusion about that there are uh, separation and distinction a correlation uh, between food Japanese and Muslim food Japanese. Is it true? Food, food Japanese? I, I cannot understand. Food, food Japanese. What is food? Food. Do you not hear me? No, uh, no, I, no, I'm not. Oh, okay, okay. I, I would what, like what to uh, write in know. the chat room. There is a question for me from uh, Nunu Sensei. Can I reply that first? Yeah, sure. She asked me that uh, uh, what food of Japan has been registered as UNESCO uh, heritage. So what I know is uh, Kai Sekiriori. Kai Sekiriori is like everyday food. It's a uh, beautiful, not only Sekiriori, but uh, all other kind of Japanese food, which is very beautiful, presentable, that is considered as a UNESCO, UNESCO World Heritage. And the criteria of uh, selection of World Her UNESCO World Heritage is mentioned on the UNESCO website. There are so many parameters. And of course, uh, there must be judges there who will declare any kind of food or place or location or park or what kind of things must be there, then it will be registered as a UNESCO food. So in my opinion, uh, Tempe, I am not sure. I really have no idea that it will be 
registered as intangible food or not because uh, tempe tempe is good healthy food i i like it very much by myself but it will be registered as, there or not i am not sure i'm sorry for that and sugimoto sensei no tame ni mushite mo koite arimasu okay hi hi okay so yeah thank you very much arigatou gozaimasu so are you a mesh of food japan you mean you mean japanese food what is food japan You mean traditional Japanese food? There is a difference between traditional Japanese okay. food and the Muslim food? Mm-hmm. Is this the question? Yes. Ah, mm-hmm. okay. Uh, this is actually the question, I think, for the Dr. Saeed uh, Akhtar, because this is, you're talking, talking about food, right? You're asking about food. I, I never talked about food. Let me, let me read the question, I will reply that. You please read the question from Nunu Sensei for you. Ah, okay, okay. For me? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, okay. How is the response and the policy of the Japanese government to many mosques that have uh, sprung up in Japan and increased the number of pilgrims from Japan? Is discrimination special treatment of Japanese government for service? Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, the, for the first question, how is the response and policy of Japanese government to many mosques? So, uh, you know, uh, in Japan, uh, it is basically a secularism. So okay. government never involved any religious activities. It's prohibited by law. So Japanese government never involved. Uh, there's no special policy or any response uh, towards the so-called uh, Muslim uh, like community activities or the masjid activities, okay? So there is no specific policy. Only they have a foreign policies towards Middle East or Muslim majority countries. But this is nothing to do with relig- religious matters. So number two, uh, about pilgrimage, about Hajj. Uh, so, 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 okay, anyway, anyway, Hajj also is nothing to do with Japanese government. So this is a completely, purely the private initiative. So uh, Saudi embassy, they appointed, uh, accepted, the, I think four agency, four agents, uh, 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 travel agent in Japan uh, who allowed to uh, collect uh, the Hajj, the pilgrim, pilgrims uh, from Japan and they apply for visa. So that is what, what's going on in terms of Hajj. So is there any discrimination, special treatment from the Japanese government for Islam based? Uh, there is no discrimination, special treatment. So it, it's the it's re- same response to the first question. So basically the Japanese government do not have any special uh, involvement uh, towards the Islamic based NGO. Uh, only uh, if uh, there is any like uh, terrorism issues, any national security issues, probably the, the police uh, will check. This is nothing to do with uh, Islam as a religion, but in the national security matter only. But otherwise, as far as we are like praying five times a day, uh, we are fasting during Ramadan, or like a charity activities, any um, cultural exchange programs, Japanese government never involved never say anything about this. I, I, I don't know, is that really respond to your question? To um, add your uh, yeah. statement, yes. I would say that the Japanese government uh, properly allow Islamic organization to be registered as a Islamic religious organization. We call it uh, Shukyo. Shukyo Hojin. So Shukyo Hojin are many, uh, Islamic Shukyo Hojin are many registered in Japanese government. So there is no discrimination about that matter. If you fulfill the requirements of Shukyo Hojin, then anybody can register that. Until now, as far as I know, more than five to 10 uh, Shukyo Hojins are being registered. So there is no discrimination about uh, Muslim in Japan. Rather, it's more Muslim friendly country than any other place in the world. And the first question is about this food, Muslim food, in Japan are early food in Japan. So 
So as I mentioned that uh, Muslim food basically is nothing special. It's just a food. Uh, it must not contain any kind of haram material. And if you go back to the early Japanese food, they also never contain any kind of haram material in that. Haram from religious, Islamic religious values point of view also. Uh, Japanese people didn't know that pork is halal or not halal in the past. And they also didn't know as well this uh, uh, beef is, is halal or not halal. But naturally, their food did not consist of these things. After World War I and after World War II, when Japan country opened for foreigners, many uh, Americans or American allies invaded Japan. So at that time, they brought their culture and their food with them. And if I may explain to you, this whiskey or beer, whiskey, beer, this kind of drinks came to Japan after 1930s. And it became famous after 1945. So Japanese people were not used to drink a lot of beer or vodka or wine or all these things were not available at all. Even the first whiskey company built in Hokkaido was after 1935. So really, and that 1935 also uh, considered as a, a kind of alcoholic drink, which is not ours, meaning it's not sake, it's not ours. So Japanese were really not accepting that whiskey things for Japan people completely rejecting that. But with the passage of time, when American invaded, then they brought other countries, so many different type of alcoholic drinks. And from there, uh, to, if you ask me my personal study that uh, after World War II, this all disaster of food problem happened and Japanese people start eating the non-halal food. Non-halal from religious point of view, non-halal from uh, not good health point of view, like alcoholic drinks are really not good for health. The pig, uh, pork is not good for health. So, but it's become culture and then processed foods. Uh, now, if you see the factories which are making even with in Indonesia or in uh, Malaysia, or in uh, Japan, all the processed foods are not good for health. So we uh, try our best to avoid even in Indonesian food, we should try avoid the processed foods, packed foods, and our home cooked food coming from fresh vegetables are made by our own spices. That is the best food to eat. Uh, in 1940s and 45, if you go back to the data of Japanese people health, the cancer was not very common in Japan. But now in Japan, 50% uh, of Japanese people have cancer. So it's a huge big number if you compare within this short period of time of 60, 70 years that uh, within a very short time, how, how is possible that 50% uh, of Japanese got cancer? So it's all my personal research is that is coming from food and food which is, we are not sure which, we, which is shubha food. When we eat that, that create the uh, cancer kind of shubha kind of med, uh, disease. So if you, uh, coming back to your question that uh, early, food in Japan and Muslim food in Japan. Muslim food, now I tell you that Muslim food, when we say Muslim, Muslim food, basically it's an Indonesian food, it's a Pakistani food, it's a Arab food, it's a Jordanian food, it's not a Muslim food. Any food can be Muslim food if it, it contains all kind of ingredients as halal ingredients. So it can be Japanese food, it can be Italian food, it can be American food, whichever the food which consists of all the ingredients as per Islamic law, uh, halal ingredients, then it is a, inshallah halal. So uh, I, I don't consider that these two things are two different things, particularly Japanese previous years of Japanese food, everything was halal without any certification. Even nowadays, maybe if you have heard the izakaya, izakaya is a, uh, uh, famous as a drinking place like where Japanese people go and eat and drink at night. So other than you take the alcoholic drinks from that area, that shop, that restaurant, 80 to 90% foods are halal even nowadays. No need of halal certification. That much, uh, that old traditional style of Japanese eating is halal. So we should be very much confident if you are coming to Japan, you please choose the Japanese food. It will be halal, inshallah. Everything will be halal. Thank you, Dr. Sahib and Koichiro. Yeah, nice. Yeah.
question for Dr. Said. So three years ago, I went to Dr. Said. Okay, the talking about three years ago, I come to Japan and I see uh, takoyaki and I ask it is halal or not halal. Unfortunately, uh, the shopkeeper, the seller didn't know it is halal or not halal. So, okay. What I can tell you is that halal is a really new thing in Japan. When I started this halal certification work in 2010, and I go to Japanese companies, I ask them, please take halal certificate. So the first question is, what is halal? So really they don't know what this halal is. So from that story, we started in 2010 and we start teaching Japanese people and we start teaching more and more and went to all over Japan, giving seminars and giving lectures and teaching them about halal food. Now it come to the place where Alhamdulillah, the Japanese people and those stores, uh, restaurants or takoyaki people, they understand this uh, halal food and not halal food somewhat but still the details of that thing, they don't understand. So if uh, one more Japanese behavior is that they won't, don't want to take any responsibility of your religion. So if you say that, uh, is this halal or not halal? So they will ask you, are you going to eat this for a religious purpose or for allergy purpose? If it is an allergy purpose, they will give you more explanation. But if you will say this is a religious purpose, right away they will tell you it's better you don't eat. Why? Because they don't want to take any responsibility that because of their mistake, you t eat the food which is not halal. So most of the time we in Japan face this difficulty that uh, Japanese people straight away tell us that it's okay, you don't eat this uh, food. Why? Because we are too much concerned about halal. So about takoyaki, usually the ingredients of takoyaki, all are halal, is uh, inside is uh, octopus and some other flour, flour ingredients are there. So those things uh, you need not to worry about. You have to worry about only the basic, like you are going to eat ramen and ramen has uh, uh, pork soup or straightforward pork meat. So those kind of things, please try to avoid. Otherwise, I think that uh, when you see a sushi and then you see a shoyu there and alcohol is written there on the shoyu, that alcohol is not, not a problem at all to eat or consume. This I'm talking about a religious fatwa of a MUI or of a, uh, Saudi Arabia, we call it Darul Ifta Jeddah. That more than 80 different school of thoughts are sitting and they give fatwa that industrial alcohol, which is used in perfumes or which is used in industry for uh, disinfection of in machines or those kind of things, that alcohol is halal in China. Halal in the sense that you cannot drink that, but if it's being used in industry, you need not to worry about that halal. There are two things in, uh, in Islamic terminology. One is called a najis, one is called tahir. So tahir mean clean, najis mean dirty. So this alcohol itself is not najis, it is tahir by fatwa. And uh, if you are being used for disinfection of hands or machines, it is no problem at all in China. Easiest way to ask is that Bhutaniku uh, Haitimaska Haitinaidiska. If you ask question in Japanese, Bhutaniku. Bhutaniku is a big meat. So if straightforward, if you know that kind of question, very simple, easy Japanese, that will help you a lot. But problem will be that if you ask a Bhutaniku Haitimaska and reply will come in Japanese, then what is the reply? You will not understand that. So better you ask just straight easy question so people can catch it. So Vimodasan, there is a question for you. Okay. Okay, so the question is, how do the Japanese people respond to the increasing number of mosques and Muslims in Japan? And how is the cross culture with the Muslim <laughs> in Japan today? Okay. Okay. Um, no, I, I mean, e even though there are an increasing masjid, number of masjid, uh, and the Muslims, 
Uh, however, still in terms of population, the percentage is 0.16% only. So even not reaching to 1% uh, compared to like uh, total population of Japan. So there is not yet social significance of the, the, the social presence of Muslims in Japan. So there is no, not much like uh, uh, social pressure, uh, unlike West. Uh, still, uh, people are, uh, I think, generally friendly to the Muslims, uh, I believe. And there is no uh, harsh response uh, towards the like a masjid and the neighbors. As far as uh, we are good, as far as Muslims are good, not violating the, the local rules and the regulations, uh, Japanese people do not uh, react uh, negatively. Uh, however, uh, in terms of uh, graveyard, we have some uh, serious issue uh, because of legal matter, uh, as well as uh, some uh, local tradition. Uh, so when it comes to masjid and, and number of Muslims, uh, we don't have so serious problems. Uh, only so far I observed the only graveyard issue is something serious. And how is the cross culture between Muslims and Japan? Uh, I'd like to know what do you mean by cross culture? Uh, do do you do, are you asking uh, any similarities between the Muslims and the Jap Japanese culture? What, what does it mean? Can you specify the question? Do you have? Do you mean that the, any any interaction between the Japanese and the Muslims? You mean? Uh, maybe multicultural between Muslim and Japan. Can you specify? I don't really uh, get I the point. I brother. I brother. Okay, okay, okay. That uh, in Japan, it's not like in America or in those countries where Muslims are living since long time and we have so big communities. In Japan, we are living very much mixed with the Japanese people. We, our neighbors are Japanese. Our, we, very rare, any one Muslim person is neighbor is another Muslim. So we are living in very much mixed culture and Japanese people do not create any trouble for us or any difficulty for us until the time we do not create trouble for them. Meaning is we are the outsiders. We are coming from other country. We have to understand the Japanese culture. So one, Japanese are very cultural nation. It's not that easy nation to adapt with. So there are certain rules, regulations uh, have to throw the garbage of the house on that particular days. You have to make a pet bottles and other bottles and other uh, hard uh, garbage separately. So if you do not make separate, then Japanese will feel difficulty that these foreigners who do not follow our rules. Because we are the, coming from outside, so we have to follow the rules. If we keep on following the rules, Japanese are very much friendly. Like my house is within the more than like 20, 30 Japanese houses. And all of them are very cooperative, very helpful. And first of all, they will teach you the rules. If you do one time mistake or two time mistake, still they'll teach you the rules. But if you keep on breaking the law, then they will be angry to you. So when they're angry to you, you don't think that, oh, they are not friendly because I'm Muslim. No, no, nothing like that. Uh, it's just a, a foreigners. Why Japanese people feel difficulty to uh, bring more foreigners uh, in Japan is because of the, we, we foreigners coming with our own culture and we really do not follow the Japanese culture. So if we match with Japanese culture, they are very good and very friendly. Inshallah, no problem at all. I hope we, both of us, answer the question. Uh, yeah, one more question was there for halal food access. If you go to Nippon Asia Halal Association Facebook site, when you are visiting Japan, or you have any question related to uh, halal food within Japan, you just send us the picture of the label what food you want to buy. And within a few minutes, we will reply you that this food is halal or not halal. So feel free to ask anytime any question, even sometime uh, any Indonesian people buy a gift from airport and bring it to you and you don't know that is halal or not halal. You are in Indonesia, you don't know how to read Japanese. 
just take a picture of the label and send to Nippon Asia Halal Association message. And inshallah, we will reply you very soon. If you are in Japan, download this uh, application. It's called Halal Japan application. This application has a QR code system that you uh, ask for search and then put the camera on the product QR code, uh, sorry, the barcode. And it will tell you this is Halal certified or not Halal certified. So these two systems you can use anytime when you are in Japan. Uh, accessed by Muslim in Japan, what about his availabilities? Uh, as I said, in the past, very difficult to find uh, Japanese halal food. But nowadays, inshallah, in Tokyo, Osaka, Kobe, Fukuoka, major cities, not only they have masjids, uh, they also have uh, available halal food. So wherever you are uh, in Japan, just put halal food in that area, whichever the area you are. And inshallah, you will uh, find that uh, some halal facilities will be nearby in, in that area. So even if it is not in that area, there are certain other foods which you can eat Japanese food like sushi or tempura. And inshallah, sushi and tempura both are halal. Japanese style of making tempura is of uh, goreng actually. The AB, AB is shrimp goreng or other things. So inshallah, all those are uh, fried in vegetable oil and it will be halal inshallah, no problem. Food packaging is a bit complicated, difficult. You cannot uh, easily read. Yeah, one method of reading is that you can download the Google Translate and put the camera on the product and ingredients, basic ingredients, you will be able to read. But uh, yeah, that much you can read more than that. You will not be understand. So you just take a picture and send it to us. We will like, read for you. This service is free for, from us always for all Muslims living in Japan or visiting Japan. There are some products which is halal certified, but not yet that commonly available in open market. So maybe you will feel difficulty to find the halal food. I think uh, many people are interested in halal food. So you can ask me to do uh, next presentation about halal food in Japan. I can explain more details. Okay, I answer another question. Yes, please. This uh, from the Lucifi Lu 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 son. So I want to ask uh, Simo san are uh, most of the masjid in Japan located in Muslim only areas such as Muslim villages or in area with the heterogeneous populations. So basically in Japan the population Muslim population is so small and then they are living scattered. So there is no such a Muslim only areas. Uh, there is no Muslim villages so called. So basically masjid all masjid are located in the heterogeneous population basically major cities in Japan, like in Tokyo, in Osaka, uh, like in, in, in Kobe, Kyoto, Fukuoka, and Nagoya, like major cities. I hope I answer your question. And I think then next is uh, doc, uh, Dr. Said. You, I think the question is to you from, from Johnny san I think he's not available, so let me uh, answer another question from Johnny Sam. Uh, so I'm wondering whether Japanese Muslim produce produce uh, proselytizers. These are dawa, right? Uh, proselytizers to spread Islam teaching across Japan. Uh, I, I don't understand what they mean. Produce? You mean you are asking allowed to make dawa to across Japan? 
Uh, can you speak, uh, can you reiterate this uh, question? I mean, uh, 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 you mean uh, train, uh, training training dais? Edu educate educate dais, yes. Oh, yes. Educate, dais. educate okay okay educate dais right? Uh, yes, this is done on on the way actually. Okay. We really need to yeah new dais. Yes. Uh, especially for among young Muslims. They know both cultures, the Muslim culture and Japanese culture. They are very fluent in Japanese language. So they are the future dais. Uh, however, um, they are, there are not many uh, young Muslims they are motivated to be dai. Um, but anyway, uh, we need to have a lot of effort to produce you know, really effective dai. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sukimoto, and for Dr. Akhtar. Maybe there is an addition for the question from Mr. Choni. Uh, if I may, I have one more question to uh, uh, I also wonder how the Jap Japanese Muslim create a, such a network with uh, Japanese around the world. Is there any certain uh, country or mashab <laughs> that uh, okay? So uh, you mentioned uh, <laughs> I got a lot of knowledge about history of Jap Islam in Japan. As you mentioned yeah. in presentation, many students from Indonesia and Malaysia who died during the Hiroshima Nagasaki bombs. Yes, I want to know more about that. Ah, uh, so. Uh, I don't have the spe I mean more materials uh, right now, so maybe uh, if you if you want maybe uh, we can exchange the emails, and I send to some historical sites of their graveyard uh, or any historical like research papers. Oh, thank you so much. Yes. If there is no further question, can we go to the prayer now? Can we finish this today's session? Oh, yeah, already Maghrib, yeah? Yeah. In Japan. Mm. Okay, thank you very much for Mr. Kimoto and Dr. Akhtar. I hope you all enjoyed this amazing presentation and discussion. Now, we can close our presentation and thank you for joining this discussion and Mr. Sukimoto and Dr. Akhtar also for answering those questions and for the great presentation. It was a pleasure to have you with us. So this concludes our webinar. Thank you for, for attending. We hope you have learned and enjoyed this presentation. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.